Today's webinar is the fifth in a series regarding the Highway Safety Manual presented by the Florida Department of Transportation. Today's webinar regards the Highway Safety Manual, also known as HSM, Part C, Chapter 11 on Multi-Lane Rural Highways. Good morning, my name is Jack Freeman and welcome to this webinar training. I am a senior principal with Kittleson and Associates in Orlando, Florida. My contact information is shown on this slide and please feel free to contact me individually after this webinar with any questions we have not specifically addressed during the webinar. Ready? This is the fifth of nine webinars. The previously conducted webinars can be found on the FDOT Office of Safety website. The next webinar will be conducted on Thursday, October 20th. We will also be conducting advanced HSM workshops following the completion of the webinars. The advanced workshops will be held over four days with each day focused on a specific transportation area. You can see that we have planning, PD&E, design alternatives, and traffic operations as these areas. The four workshops will be held in different parts of the state in four FDOT district offices and the dates and locations are yet to be determined. However, we do know that it will be conducted in 2017. So why is the predictive method of rural, for rural multi-lane highways important or why sh should I also say why is the predictive method important? It provides a structured methodology to estimate the expected crash frequency and crash severity and collision types. So it provides you a method that we have never had before to be able to quantifiably identify what that expected crash frequency is. And that's what we will be discussing today. The learning outcomes of today's webinar are shown in this slide. First, we'll talk about the Manual of Uniform Traffic Studies, also known as MUTS Manual, and the revisions in the 2016 edition regarding Chapter 5 that talks about specifically data collection for the Highway Safety Manual. We'll also go into safety performance functions, crash modification factors, empirical bays, very similar to what we've discussed in previous webinars, getting into ex example applications and also expand this to get into crash cost calculations and how do you calculate costs uh, as a result of crashes. It's important that because we'll be working in Excel spreadsheets that you have an understanding and are comfortable using Microsoft Excel. Before we get started, we'd like to conduct several poll questions uh, to find out a little bit about our audience. The first is, Please state the organization type where you work. And there are five different types listed here, and please select the appropriate one. A second poll question is, what technical area do you primarily work in? And again, there are five types, uh, and if it's not appropriate to you, select the other category, and I'll give you a moment for that. Third question is, please state your past experience using the Highway Safety Manual. From, I've never used this manual, never used the HSM before, or going to the range is, I could teach this course and take my job. And then the final question is, do you have access to the Highway Safety Manual? Ranging from yes, I have it available in different types of categories there, to no, and uh, you know, is the HSM in your office or not in your office. Today's webinar is focused on Chapter 11, Rule Multi-Lane Highways from Part C of the Highway Safety Manual. This is the second of five webinars we will be conducting on Part C, the predictive chapters. And you will notice that we have expanded these Part C chapters to include 18 and 19 freeways and ramps, which will come in future webinars. The Part C introduction provides information with regards to crash predictive methods. The prediction is based upon facility type, average annual daily traffic, and various geometric elements. Crash severity can also be predicted. 
Chapter 11 encompasses crash prediction methods for segments of rural, multi-lane highways and intersections along them. Historically, we've had to speculate about crash about safety instead of being able to quantify this and has, has affected some of our design dis decisions, making statements such as this won't be safe. However, with the Highway Safety Manual, it enables us to quantify safety to make project decisions similar to what we've done for years, such as 2.65 acres of wetlands will be impacted, delay decreases from X to Y. Now we can say 11.8 crashes per year are expected to be eliminated. The relationship between crashes and volumes, though, is nonlinear. So the use of crash lights, rates can be misleading. And I'd like to show you a few examples of this over the next few slides. This slide shows several different pieces of information. The blue line is the safety performance function. The green line is an average crash rate, which is linear and increasing as ADD, ADT increases across the bottom scale or the x-axis. The red point is historical crash data for this facility. So the point of this slide is, is that it would appear that we do not have a safety issue as compared to the average crash rate for the facility. But in reality, it has a crash frequency well above what the safety performance function predicts so there actually may be a safety issue. So, so a poll question would be, if you look at this example, would you target this site for safety improvements? Yes or no? The Highway Safety Manual is an AASHTO publication and must be purchased from them. They're available in hard copy or single user PDF. For FDOT staff, Central Office will be providing guidance to access the Highway Safety Manual electronically. All other resources are available for download from the website shown on this slide. Now let's start moving into some of the learning objectives that we have uh, for today's webinar. First is the FDOT Manual and Uniform Traffic Studies and I want to provide a quick overview for this. As you know, uh, in 2016, the new MUTS manual was uh, published and released by FDOT. It contains Chapter 5 regarding the data collection for transportation safety projects. And the purpose of this was to provide guidance on data collection requirements for HSM analysis. Chapter 5 provides forms to aid in traffic volumes and geometric data collection. It also contains information regarding historic crash data collection, collision diagram, and collision diagram development. Further, there is information regarding local conditions data collection and condition diagram development. The much chapter five forms provide the forms that are needed for each segment and intersection type on each HSM facility type. So there are forms for chapters 10, chapters 11, and chapters 12 within the overall much chapter five. The forms are available in downloadable spreadsheets in the FDOT forms library. The color coding on these forms is consistent and matches the 1738 spreadsheets. So in previous webinars, if you've attended, you'll know that gold is data entry and blue is different pull down type of, of uh, data to be entered. It is exactly in that manner. And then there are also generic data collection requirements and forms available for facility types not covered in the highway safety manual. So if you look at these examples, please note the similarity of these forms to the 1738 spreadsheets. These forms are intended to make data collection as easy as possible. And if you use these forms and you follow these forms, 
you should have all the information. In fact, you should. You will have all the information you need to do an HSM analysis. Historical crash data can be obtained for your analysis from the FDOT car system. And I'd like to note again that the harmful event crash codes changed in 2011, so you need to be careful if you're using data 2010 or before. Also, we'd like to just ask that you use caution when processing and analyzing crash data using automated tools because sometimes it may show crashes at a certain location that have been coded for certain locations that are actually up or down the street a little ways. So you need to be careful as you look at specific locations with regards to that, the crash data. Collision diagrams or information provided in the Highway Safety Manual, but really not needed for Highway Safety Manual analysis. However, understanding where the crashes are and such as approaches to intersection are still a very important part of the safety analysis process. And while not needed, it's very useful information in considering different countermeasures you may want to implement for a proposed improvement. When you look at summarizing crash, historical crash data, there are many different categories that you should consider. And all of these are helpful in understanding where, when, and why crashes are occurring. The site-specific conditions will lead to better site-specific countermeasures. So looking at these different types of information of crash type, crash severity, day-night crashes are all extremely helpful in analyzing and developing potential countermeasures. Within the MUTS manual, uh, we have shown FDOT collision diagrams, uh, and they are the exact same figures as figures 5, 3, and 5, 4 of the Highway Safety Manual. So we've adopted in the MUTS manual these different uh, collision diagram forms. So now let's get into the predictive method overview. And before I do that and focus on what highlighted in, in a pink color, I want to go back real quick and talk about homogeneous facilities because it's very important that you understand homogeneous facility. These were discussed previously in webinar number four. You know, I suggest that you go back and, and look at that uh, because the segmentation of how you segment it is exactly the same for chapter 11 and chapter 12 as what we've done previously for and discussed regarding chapter 10. So I'm going to move on to SPFs, crash modification factors, and the calibration factors that are specific to the rural multi-lane highway. First of all, let's talk a little bit about subscripts. And uh, each equation and variable will have a subscript. In this particular case, very similar again to what we previously discussed in the Rule Two-Lane Highway webinar, but this has one more subscript for roadway segments. We're divided. In, we have SPS for Rule Four-Lane undivided and Rule Four-Lane divided, known as 4U and 4D. The intersections are basically the same as what we had. In fact, they're exactly the same as what we had previously in, re, regarding Chapter 10. So another polling question. How many different types of rural multi-lane highway segments does the Highway Safety Manual provide SPFs for? You got three different choices, or four different, correction, four different choices provided. So let's talk about the first of the two segment SPFs the Highway Safety Manual provides in Chapter 11. This is for undivided roadway segments. There's a couple of key fa factors here that you really need to notice. First of all, the equation at the top. Uh, you now have variables A and B. Previously in Chapter 10, we dealt with average annual daily traffic and length. Now we have those variables A and B and they come out of table 11-3 uh, shown below. So these are the variables that you have 
and they vary by crash severity level. Typically we use the four lane total crash severity that we're looking for, so you would pull those variables into this equation. You also now have a K or over dispersion factor equation and you have a variable for it in this table. So the variable is shown as C in this table and it is entered into it so it's a function of that coefficient and also length to determine your over dispersion parameter. There's a very similar type of equation as we move into rule divided highway segments. Very similar process. Uh, you still have an A and B. You still enter in your average annual daily traffic and length. You pull it out of the table, different tables, 11-5, uh, and you pull it in. You still also go through and, de and determine your over dispersion parameter, uh, which is used for your EB or expected value analysis, uh, and you pull that into equation. Equations are exactly the same regardless. So now I'd like to show these two SPFs graphically. The first is the rule undivided roadway segment and it ranges between uh, 0 and 35,000 average annual daily traffic as shown on the bottom or x-axis. Total crashes for this uh, as shown on the y-axis or the left the predicted average crash frequency is approximately 13 uh, crashes per year per mile. As we transition to the rule divided, multi-lane divided uh, roadway segments, we have pulled those two red lines over to here, again approximately 33,000 and at, at 13, and you can see how the total crashes have reduced approximately in half as we go to a divided roadway. Total crashes again reduced. Also notice the range. The range is out considerably more pushing toward 90,000 average annual daily traffic. So we have a much wider range as we go to four lane divided and we also have considerably fewer crashes shown by the SPF between the divided and the undivided roadways. As we start to look at crash modification factors we really need to look at what the base conditions were used to develop the safety performance functions for both the undivided and divided segments. You will notice there are some differences between the two. The undivided segment has side slope and a base condition for side slopes, but not uh, in the divided segment, whereas the divided segment has a median width, uh, logically not there for the undivided segment. So these are some variations. You also see a lot fewer of variations from base conditions or crash modification factors applicable for the multi-lane rural highway. You know, things that we saw before such as grades and horizontal curves and those types of things are not included in this particular analysis. Now I'd like to have a, another poll question. Which of the following does not have a CMF associated with it for the rural multi-lane predictive method? There are four choices, lane width, right shoulder width, horizontal curvature, and lighting. Another key element as shown in, by the blue highlight in the equation below is the calibration factor. FDOT has conducted a research project to develop calibration factors for Florida. Calibration factors for segments and intersections for rural multi-lane highways are shown here. The calibration factors for intersections has recently be, been updated and this update is reflected in this table. Also note that there is not a calibration factor for the rural four lane undivided roadway. All right. So now let's look at an example problem I will call 5A which pertains to a rural multi lane undivided roadway. In this we have certain factors that you need for both your safety performance functions and for your crash modification factors. For the AADT is provided, the length of 1.5 miles is provided, but as you look between the existing and proposed there are some changes in conditions. Lane width 
uh, from existing to proposed increases is from 11 to 12. Shoulder width increases from 4 feet to 8 feet. And we, as we look at the proposed condition, the existing has no roadway lighting, and that would be uh, present in the proposed. So let's go through this analysis and see how, how this analysis is done using the 1738 spreadsheets. So the first thing you need to do is actually open up the Chapter 11 uh, 1738 spreadsheet and be able to use this. And one of the things you'll notice is a little different across the bottom. It, as you see the tabs across the bottom, it has divided multi-lane segments and it has undivided multi-lane segments. So you need to be sure that for this analysis, you pick the undivided multi-lane segment known as the U segment one tab. You can also go above and start entering in the data into the spreadsheet as shown. Because you've already chosen the correct tab for undivided multi-lane, the divided, undivided is shown there and whited out. You need to enter in your segment length, your average annual daily traffic, and go down and enter in your different factors for lane width, etc. to go th through this. Also, it's important because the spreadsheet is looking for a calibration factor. Even though there's none existing for this particular type of facility, you should enter 1.0 as the calibration factor. The spreadsheet will go through and do the calculation for you for the different crash modification factors. And these are shown under the same tab uh, at the bottom of the spreadsheet toward the bottom of the spreadsheet. And you can see how the CMF values are. You have, you know, the narrow lanes and the narrow shoulder really don't have a great deal of effect on predicted crash frequency, having a 1.01 for lane width and a 1.04 for shoulder width. And that combined CMF at the far right comes up to be 1.05. So this allows you to come up with that existing predicted crashes, which is shown here in the table under total being 16.1. Uh, again, under the same tab, you're still in the same tab, and you just work further down the overall worksheet. So this gets you those uh, predicted crashes. And if you see the flow chart below, you basically go through those models and you develop predicted crashes. We have historical crash data. So we're going to use historical crash data to now come up and do the empirical Bayes method and come up and pl apply that observed crashes to be able to come up with expected crashes, which is the process that is shown in the flow chart. But before we go do that, let's just recap where we've gone and what we've talked about and given it a, uh, an opportunity for any questions. We've gone through the MUTS manual and shown you a little bit about the MUTS manual and what's a, you, what you have in there to be able to do data collection. We've talked about the safety performance functions and how they vary and, and how they're a little bit different than what you've seen in the previous webinar. And we've also talked about crash modification factors and the different crash modification factors. So I'd like to open it up for any questions you may have regarding these first three learning objectives that we have for uh, this webinar. So let's talk a little bit now about the EB application and how do you move and be able to do this within the 1738 spreadsheet. The data entered must be entered under the rule multi-lane site tab. You can see that with the orange arrow pointing toward it. So you go out further to the right and you find that rule multi-lane site tab. And the Crash data for all the segments and intersections is entered at this location. If you don't have crash data broken down by segments, you could go one tab over and enter in for the project tab. If you have multi-segments, you could then go in and use the rule multi-lane project total and enter that in for the multi-segments that you have. But in this case, since we're only dealing with one segment for this particular example, it would go under the site tab. So when you click on the rule multi-lane site total tab, you will see 
this form. And you will see that there's a column under Observe Crashes that has the yellow or gold highlighted cells. Within that is where you enter the observed crashes. In this particular case, we have five crashes per year. We, we were given the total of 15 crashes over three years for five crashes per year. And we enter that in. And then the spreadsheet will go through and calculate the expected crash frequency. In this particular case, that expected crash frequency is 8.7 as shown in the circled area. So now let's go to the proposed condition. And again, there are three conditions that are varying between the existing and the proposed. The lane width goes from 11 feet to 12 feet. The shoulder width goes from 4 feet to 8 feet. And the roadway segment is now lit and lighting will be present. So we will go through and analyze those proposed conditions. The first thing you need to do is take what you just did for the existing condition spreadsheet and save that and, and then label it as a proposed spreadsheet. So you'll have two separate spreadsheets. You'll have an existing condition spreadsheet and you will have a proposed condition spreadsheet. Now you will go and open up that proposed spreadsheet and you will make three changes. And those are highlighted here in red. Again, you're underneath the undivided multi-lane tab. You'll go in and change the lane width from 11 to 12. You'll change the shoulder width from 4 to 8. And you'll change and pull down on the tab to change the lighting to be present. And the spreadsheet will then go through and recalculate for you your overall predicted crash frequency. You, you can see now that you have different crash modification factors. And these, you know, when you compare to these to the existing condition, these are what actually gives you that proposed improvement. Your lane width has changed slightly. Uh, your shoulder width is reduced somewhat as well. And now you have a lighting CMF. And your, to and your total combined crash modification factor has gone from 1.05 down to 0.91. So as we go through the analysis and we start in and look at it, we have a predicted crashes for the existing conditions of 16.1 and an expected of 8.7. And we go through and we have now a proposed of 14 that comes out of the spreadsheet. But we, how do we go through and now calculate the expected crash frequencies? We do not have observed crash data for the proposed condition. So we have to go through a little bit of a different type of process than what we've done before. To best illustrate this, we like to use a graph. So we can't simply enter the data into the site location like we did before because it's not valid. We don't have observed crash data for here. So we're going through a bit of a ratio perspective. And if you look at this graph, you can see you know, for the existing design, you know, uh, we had a predicted crash, and it was about 16. We had a, a expected uh, value of about 8. So, you know, we, we can create a ratio. So we consider the ratio of predicted to expected, and now we look, we have a, a new predicted for the proposed of 14. So we need to go through and calculate by a ratio method the expected crash frequency. The Highway Safety Manual provides us with an equation here, equation A15, to be able to go through it. We can't do um, EB in the, you know, in the spreadsheet. You can't do it manually because you don't have historic data for the proposed improvement. Now, the 1738 spreadsheet does incorporate this calculation in the crash cost uh, cal capabilities that I'll cover later in this webinar. But to manually calculate it, this is the equation you would use. So you can see the unexpected for the pr proposed condition would be a ratio of 8.7, which is your expected crash frequency for the existing conditions, times the ratio between the unpredicted of the proposed divided by the unpredicted of the existing. 
in this particular case, it would reduce down to 7.6. So that's a ratio, um, you know, that ratio is how we would then create and, and estimate the new and predicted for the proposed condition. You see the results here, and what do the results actually mean? You know, what are they telling you here? Well, the real, the, one of the big things we're seeing is, is that you've got a very high predicted crashes here. But because we have now applied empirical bays and we have observed crashes and we've applied observed crashes, predicted was 16.1. The actual observed crashes were, were five per year. So that made a, a large adjustment to be able to come up with expected crashes and being able to do that. And you can also see that in applying this, you if you make the proposed improvements that we were talking about here, you would probably get in the range of 10 to 15 percent reduction in overall expected crashes as a result of this. But I'd like to ask you another poll question. Do we actually expect 8.7 and 7.6 crashes per year on this road before and after the improvement is implemented? Yes or no? So again, reviewing our learning outcomes, we've now covered empirical Bayes uh, methods and we're going to get into some example application and get into crash costs in the uh, forthcoming slides. So let's look at another example. In this case, we're going to look at a rural multi-lane highway uh, with a divided roadway segment. We have existing and proposed data here um, and looking at the AADTs of 33,500, the segment length, we could go through and look at our different factors affecting CMFs and we see a change in shoulder width from four feet to eight feet. We have the calibration factor of 0.68 and we also have observed crash data for three-year period of 21 crashes over a three-year period or seven crashes per year. Our goal is to be able to complete this table, uh, going through and looking at it for existing conditions and coming up with predicted and expected because we have historic data and then be able to do this for our proposed conditions. So we go to our NCHRP 1738 spreadsheet we go to our tab called Divided Multi-Lane and be able to click on it, and we get a few things. The first thing I'd like to note is if you see roadway type, you see divided, and it's white. It's because you're in the divided tab. Also, you can go in and now enter in your segment length, your AADT, and the different factors that are affecting the crash modification fact factors shown here in blue. You'll also notice that Side slopes is now white because there is no CMF for side slopes in the divided analysis. And you, and you now can enter in a median width. So these are different variations that we had between this and the undivided. And you enter in your calibration factor. So having completed all the input data, we can now move down to the bottom of the divided multi-lane spreadsheet to obtain the in predicted for total crashes as shown here as 5.4. We not then need to move on to be able to calculate the in expected using the equation shown below and the ratio method we have previously discussed. For this, we would bring forward the, uh, the existing conditions in predicted and in expected. Uh, and enter those into the equation and also use the 5.4 for the proposed condition. And you can see that has been done here for you, resulting in an overall unexpected for the proposed condition of 6.0. So now having completed this analysis, what do these values tell us? We can see that overall the improvement results in some reduction in crashes, both for the predicted and the expected. However, the other thing is because we have higher observed crashes than we had predicted crashes, the expected value is higher as well. So that, you know, 
and that is the adjustment. So the values you, sh you should be using in discussing crashes for this particular site are 6.5 crashes per year for the existing conditions and 6.0 crashes per year for the proposed conditions. So the poll question is, do we actually expect 6.5 and 6.0 crashes per year for this road before and after the improvement is implemented? So now let's take a look at the rural multi-lane highway intersection safety performance functions. Similar to what we had in uh, the rural two-lane roadway, we have three different conditions for SPFs the three-leg stop control, the four-leg stop control, and the four-leg signalized intersections. However, uh, we'll discuss in a minute that the intersection form for the four-leg signal uh, is a little bit different, so we will discuss that uh, in, in much greater detail uh, in upcoming slides. Each of these uh, intersection types have safety performance functions for total crashes and then looking at breaking out the crashes However, because we use crash distribution factors that have, uh, have been, or percentages that have been developed in uh, Florida, we typically uh, use those for these analyses. So let's look at the, uh, the multi-lane you know, stop control intersections and their variations from base conditions and what are these base conditions. Uh, very similar to what we had for the two-lane rule, we have a skew angle or intersection angle. We have you know, left turn and right turn lanes, and we have lighting. And we can use these to develop different crash modification factors in our overall NSAP calculation or in predicted calculation. For the four-leg signalized intersections, uh, these can only be used for generalized predictions. There are no base conditions, there are no CMFs for the four-legged intersection, so we can only use this to be to do generalized predictions uh, for crashes. So now let's look at an intersection example. And what we want to do is expand upon the previous 5B example that we did for the multi-lane divided segment being 1.2 miles long. And what we want to do is add an intersection at one end of this segment. Uh, it would be a, a four-leg signalized intersection. Uh, the minor street approach would have an AADT of 5,000. Uh, again, 51 crashes over three years, or 17 crashes per year. Uh, no changes uh, at the intersection with the proposed uh, condition, so there'll be no changes at that intersection. And we would again go through and use the 1738 spreadsheet uh, and do the analysis here. In this particular case, we would go to the, uh, the multi-lane uh, intersection one tab and be able to use that. Uh, you get a little bit different spreadsheet than what you had before, uh, but you still can go down and uh, the blue, scroll down and get a four SG or four signalized. You'd have to enter in your ADT values, the 33,500 comes forward from the previous analysis we did, for example, 5B, uh, and bring that into it. And uh, we would, uh, the 5,000 for the minor approach, uh, everything is base conditions, and the calibration factor is 0 0.45. From this, we can uh, again go to the bottom of the same multi-lane tab, uh, intersection one tab, and we get an in predicted of 11.2 uh, crashes per year, for, total crashes per year for this intersection. Okay, so we have historical data again, um, and you know, 51 crashes over three years or 17 crashes per year. This gets entered into, we go to the rural multi-lane site uh, total tab. Uh, this would get entered into at the top of the form into the uh, into the yellow box uh, and enter that 17 in. Uh, and this increases our in predicted uh, and 
allows us to compute the unexpected value of uh, 15.6 and we would get an increased value of 15.6 for unexpected. So we can go through and do this and kind of complete our, our summary solution sheet here. Since the existing and proposed conditions are exactly the same, we're not making any changes for this intersection. The unpredicted and the unexpected for both the existing and proposed would be the same. So uh, we would enter that in. But now let's look at it as, and go through. So now let's look at this when we bring the two conditions together of the segment and the intersection and look at it as a total transportation facility. And in here you can see uh, we're in the rural multi-lane site total. Uh, for the 5B example, with looking at the segment, we had observed crashes of seven. You can see that in the, uh, in the yellow cell. For the intersection, we have observed crashes of 17 per year. Uh, and you can see that also in the cell, uh, totaling up and coming through. And you can see down in the bottom here that we now have our total crashes for looking at it from a intersection and a roadway segment. So the spreadsheet will total all that for you together. So now what I'd like to do is move to a little bit more summary format for us to be able to review the results of examples 5B for the roadway segment analysis and 5C for the, the signalized intersection analysis. And you see here the existing and the proposed values for both predicted crashes and expected crashes. I'd like to focus on the expected values and the expected crashes. You can see from the, ex the existing sum is 22.1 for expected crashes in the existing conditions. With adding in the shoulder and widening the shoulder from four feet to eight feet, we have a reduction in crashes expected, of, a slight reduction in crashes expected down to 21.6. There's another method of way of doing empirical bays. I hit on it earlier, but there's also, it's called project level EB. And as you go through and what this is for a condition where you have crash data, but you don't have it geolocated where that you know exactly where it is. You have it from a point A to a point B, you know you've had this many crashes in that area, but you don't know exactly where they are. So you can go through and, and segmentize and put everything in intersections, but then you can say, okay, I've had X number of crashes in this particular area you know, on it an average annual basis. So we can go through and do that and do a project level analysis, EB project level analysis. Doing the site is preferred, but if you cannot break it down and get the exact location of the crash data, which in FDOT terms, because we have geototed crash data, should, you know, should really not occur. But let me show you how it's done. We can go back up in here and go through and the first thing you need to do is click on the rural multi-lane project total tab. So there's a, it's right beside the site total. You just click on the site project total. You go down to the bottom and uh, go down to the form and you look at it under observed crash column. You see the bottom where everything's combined together. That's now yellow highlighted. All the other areas are no longer highlighted at all. So this is only for the the project total and you would enter in that total number of crashes here and you would go through the analysis based upon a total number of crashes of in this particular case it happened to be 30. Uh, so it goes through there and has that together and you go through and you can still do your expected value uh, It's computed by ratios but you can go through and do this uh, and be able to come up with an expected value uh, similar to what we did for the site-specific EB uh, and go through that analysis. As we move into the economic appraisal process and start talking about how do we start taking this crash prediction that we have done and the expected values we have done and start to put it into monetary things, you know, we can basically express all of this into, into monetary terms. Uh, and go through and do benefit cost analysis. We can do 
net present value analysis and go through and look at economic effectiveness of making uh, certain countermeasure improvements and being able to do this. So we could go through and you know quantify the crash reduction from the existing proposed. We've been talking about that. Uh, we can use that and then go through and develop that monetary value for the crash benefit you know, or the benefit from making this improvement. We can also look at it as a relationship to project cost and go through that analysis. The benefit cost analysis process is discussed in uh, Part B, Chapter 7, the economic appraisal. Um, and as we go through this process, what we need to do is look at Part C, crash predictions. Um, and we can use crash severity from either Part C, but we'll talk a little bit more detail about using the FDOT crash distribution process as we go through this and look at it there. So as we get into the cost-benefit analysis and we start looking at uh, what are we doing, we're following the pr procedures that were introduced in Part B, Chapter 7, the Economic Appraisal Chapter of the Highway Safety Manual. And we need to look at what are the data requirements to do this. Well, we've been doing that with our Part C crash predictions for both existing and proposed conditions and going through that. And so we now need to start looking at, you know, what are the costs of those crashes and how do they occur, breaking them down into different types of crash types. And also looking at your project and what's the lifespan and the project cost of your project. FDOT has taken this, the NCHRP 1738 spreadsheets and they have done a crash cost calculation add-on to the spreadsheet. And we'll get into that. And it also enables uh, used EB analysis as you go through this uh, analysis process. So you can do it for both in predicted and in expected analysis. So as you look at this uh, analysis process, um, we need to first estimate the change in crashes uh, you know, for the proposed project. We use this, the spreadsheets, the NCHRP 1738 plus the FDOT spreadsheet. You use it twice because you're using it for existing and proposed. Um, then you go through and convert those uh, costs to benefits and basically what is the, the difference between the, the life cycle cost for the existing condition plus the life cycle cost of the proposed. And you look at it over what that life, lifespan is. And you also have to go through and estimate project costs and look at that and what is that project cost and we'll talk a little bit about that in, in a few minutes and then you go through and compute the benefit cost ratio. So crash severity, um, you know the highway safety manual does have some things on crash severity we wanted to point that out um, you know but crash severity is needed to be able to go through and get the monetary value of the crashes uh, and it does contain different uh, formulas to be able to go do that but again what we want you to use for the purposes of this is the FDOT uh, crash distributions that are done based upon CABCO uh, type scale and we will go through that discussion in just a moment. FDOT has crash costs that they have developed they are contained in uh, they're shown here and they're contained in the FDOT plans preparation manual they're in chapter 23 uh, specifically that's table uh, 23.5.2 and uh, and these are periodically updated so you know don't get locked in on these you need to be watching the PPM as it goes through updates to make sure that you've got the current uh, information so and then we use that crash cost to go through and predict um, you know what are the, the actual uh, cost based upon that and we use distribution of statewide crashes in Florida to be able to go through that and look at determine the cost for fatal or injury or PDO type crashes. These distributions are shown here in this table um, so you see it, it's done for undivided and divided uh, distributions and breaking, broken down by uh, again CABCO which is you know K for fatal and 
Type A crash is severe, and you can see those distributions here totaling to 100%. And these have been incorporated into the FDOT version of the NCHRP 1738 spreadsheet. So when you go into the spreadsheet and you say, I'm doing for an undivided facility, it will automatically populate those percentages into the spreadsheet. Uh, and the distributions reflect uh, 2010 to 2014 data. So as you know, we go on in time, this data will get updated. Let's look, go back and look at an example of this and being able to go through and develop the benefit cost ratio using the, spread, the spreadsheets. And so the question is, what is the benefit cost of widening the shoulder from four feet to eight feet? And so we need to compute the present value of existing conditions and we need to go through and compute the present value of proposed conditions. And we also need to have some additional information, you know, what's, what's the lifespan or life cycle of the improvement? We'll assume this to be 20 years and the cost of adding the shoulders will assume to be uh, $300,000. So some of the things that we need to have as inputs into the benefit costs part of the spreadsheet are the cost, cal cost calculation spreadsheet are shown here. We need to know the opening year of the facility. We need to know the analysis period. In this particular case, we know it's 20 years because the life cycle of the facility is 20 years. We need to know the traffic growth rate. What is the traffic going to grow on an annual basis? 1%, 2%, 2 tenths of a percent, whatever it is. And then uh, what is that rate of return? Um, you know, for, per FDOT PPM, we should use 4%, but you may be doing something that's not FDOT and you may need to use it so you have the flexibility to be able to do that. And then there's a question on the spreadsheet that says, what's crash data used? And if you say yes, then it gets you into that in predicted analysis, or in, excuse me, in expected analysis. And it will go through and do certain uh, calculations. If it's the existing spreadsheet, it's the normal calculations you typically do for in expected and predicted. Uh, but if it's proposed, then you must enter in and we'll demonstrate those how you enter in the existing conditions in predicted and in expected values to be able to go through that ratio calculation we previ have previously discussed. If you don't have crash data, you don't need to worry about what I'm talking about here. So uh, we go through that process in the analysis. So let's take a look at the spreadsheet. And first of all, where can you find it? Well, if you go down to the bottom tab, you will see uh, you know, segment and it will say crash crash costs. And all of these, that's what you're looking for in, to get to these spreadsheets is the words crash cost. So it'll have segment or intersection crash cost and be able to go through there. So let's zoom in on that uh, grayed in or blued in area so you can actually see what it says here. And this is where you enter that data that I talked about earlier, you know, where you enter in the growth rate. What is the traffic growth rate uh, over the life cycle? You know, what is that opening year ADT? You know, the segment length, that's, that is all brought forward out of the 1738 spreadsheet. But in this case, we're saying crash data was used because we had crash data. And then you can go through and enter in uh, your opening year, your rate of return. Uh, you can tell what segment and you can tell it the analysis period. And all of this uh, gets in. And the most important thing is hit the analysis analyze button because if you don't hit that it won't take all those factors you just entered in into account. So when you hit the analyze button it's going to give you a couple of different options. It's going to ask you if you're doing an existing conditions analysis or a proposed conditions analysis because it's and it's asking for that. And if it's existing conditions, you know you go through, you just go through the calculations if it's proposed. We'll get into that in just a minute as to what the different steps you need to go through. So you hit the analyze button and you'll see this pop-up screen come up if, you know, when you have uh, crash data. So 
This is what the spreadsheet looks like. Uh, we've actually cut it in half so you can actually see something here. So this is the left-hand side of the spreadsheet. Uh, so you can see that it's got years there and it's based upon the opening year of 2016. The ADT is varying and it's based upon the growth rate that you've entered in. And again, remember all your SPFs have a couple of different functions in it. One that's always constant is AADT. And as AADT increases, crashes will increase. So that's really a key factor in doing this, these spreadsheets. And then we go through and you know, whether this is a you know, expected or a predicted analysis, it will break those number of crashes by the crash distribution factors into fatality injury or incapacity injury all the way down to PDO and uh, you know total up to whatever the crashes are. So looking at the second half of the spreadsheet you will see here that it's got the crash distributions uh, based upon Florida DOT crash distribution factors shown at the top. This is a direct input into the spreadsheet and it goes through and calculates the crash cost, the annual crash cost by different types of crash distribution, fatality all the way over to property damage only. And it gives you a total cost. And then it goes through the net present value analysis using the rate of return of 4%, etc., to be able to compute that. And you will notice it diminishes over time because that's the amount of money you need to be able to invest at this time, present time, to be able to recover that amount of money. The total net present value at the bottom is $42,887,000, and that is for the existing conditions. We'll go through and do a similar type analysis for the proposed conditions. Again, what we're doing is you need to save the spreadsheet, go through and uh, you know save it as proposed. You've already gone through and done the you know the change from eight feet to four feet and all that information gets put in. You enter the data into uh, your spreadsheet and uh, you know at, for the crash data in the FDOT side of the spreadsheet and then you hit the analysis button. And because you have crash data, now as you move into the proposed conditions, it will ask you a couple of questions when you hit the analyze button. When you click and say, I'm in proposed conditions, it will then give you a secondary screen, a second screen, and where you're bringing into the existing unpredicted and unexpected values. Same thing we did with the ratios previously. You're just bringing that in so the spreadsheet now has it to be able to go through that. So it has three values. It has your existing unpredicted, your existing in, unexpected, and it's also gone through and calculated your proposed uh, in predicted. So it can go through the ratio method and be able to use that ratio to calculate future values. And it does that and be able to go through and gives you that unexpected for future values and you can see that uh, under the uh, the site specific column and it's giving you that in predicted or unexpected value and it's going through and calculate it. And it, the same part of the spreadsheet just does exactly the same thing, continuing on, ratios it out over fatalities and the annual number of crashes, goes through and computes an annual cost based upon different crash types, and retotals it back up, and, to, and then goes through the present value at analysis part of it. And when it's all summed up, by the virtue of making that improvement, your overall present value of crashes is reduced to 39 million 631,000. So you will see a net reduction and that's over a 20 year life cycle. So now we need to break that down and let's go through the next steps of being able to compute the benefit cost ratio for the improvement. So once you uh, have done this, you'll have the benefit of, you know, you look at the benefit of the widening. Well, that is for the existing condition, we computed 42 million 800,000, I'll keep it in general numbers. Uh, and for the proposed condition, we had 39,600,000. The difference is 3.255 million. 
over 20 years. So that's the benefit you realize over a 20 year life cycle, present value. So now we need to take this and get it to an annualized benefit. And these are just generalized engineering economics equations that we use all the time. Uh, we're looking at a, a life cycle of 20 years, the 4% interest rate, and we go through and annualize the benefit, and we get take that down to an annualized benefit of $239,549. So that's the annualized benefit of making that improvement. So now that we've completed the computation of the benefit and that we need to look at the cost side, and if you recall the the construction cost was $300,000 for this improvement. And what we've used here is the FDOT benefit cost analysis spreadsheet that you can find on the FDOT website. And we pulled out the annual cost of improvements part of that spreadsheet and shown it here. Uh, it takes and uses the, the overall cost. We've entered it under roadway here of 300,000, considers a 20 year service life, with, and applies the capital recovery factor to develop an annualized cost of $22,080. So the benefit cost to now ratio is a very simple calculation at this point. We have the $239,000 for benefits, and it's an annualized benefit, and it's important that we have everything in annualized dollars. And we're also looking at the $22,000 dollar cost, annualized cost for the uh, improvement. It results in a 10.85 benefit cost analysis showing a very good benefit for making this improvement. So in summary, I'd um, like to just highlight a few things about Chapter 11 and some of the limitations that we have. Uh, and, and while there are limitations today, they won't be limitations for all that much longer. Uh, there are no SPFs for three-legged signals, uh, the always stop controller roundabouts. However, uh, all, most of this is under development with, with the uh, HSM2, the second edition of the Highway Safety Manual, scheduled for publication in a few years, 2019. Um, and there are no CMS for four-legged signals, intersections, uh, only the base can prediction. However, this is being taken care of, too, in that in the second edition. So a lot of the limitations you see here are being addressed in future upcoming editions of the, of the Highway Safety Manual. So let's review the learning outcomes and learning objectives that we had for this uh, overall webinar. Uh, we wanted to introduce you to uh, the Chapter 5, the new Chapter 5 of the MUTS Manual and talk about how data collection can be done for the Highway Safety Manual. Uh, we've talked about safety performance functions for the rural multi-lane, also crash modification factors and how we go through the empirical Bayes analysis, uh, you know, and particularly in using the uh, 1738 spreadsheet. We've also talked about how we can move from uh, an unexpected for the existing conditions to an unexpected for the proposed conditions using the ratio method. We've gone through a few project applications and we've started to introduce you There'll be more yet to come in upcoming webinars on how we go through this crash cost calculations and be able to present that to you so that you can use this tool in benefit cost analysis for future project applications. So with that, uh, we'll go now go live and answer any questions that you may have uh, and you can enter those through the chat. And thank you for your attention uh, and we'll have any questions have any questions.